Good evening and welcome to you all. It's another great privilege and wonder to be able to sit down in this room that spans the states and around the world. I was noticing you were checking how many states were represented. Well, that's tonight. Um, but always hold in mind that all over the world as time zones change there are around 10,000 or more computers. I don't know how many at each computer. The 10,000 computers in 30 different countries pick this up from our archives and so welcome to you and welcome to the world and we come again to the Word of God and trust in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And I thank every one of you that have donated. We are here every week and around the world throughout the week uh, only because you donate. It is your donations that enable us to pay for this and give it to the world for free. And so thank you. And I want to continue basically where we left off last week. Shall I ever stop saying that? And that is in Psalm 23 and in verse 5. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. And if you were with us last week, you remember that I pointed out that that was the, the blessing of God to feed David and all those who were with him in their dire straits, feed them physically, look after them even with beds and blankets uh, by some chieftains of the desert that the Spirit of God moved upon to come and share their good things with him. And they did it because they understood covenant. They were covenant brothers. David had come into their neighborhood and therefore they said he has come under the shadow of our care, our covenant care. And we, we pretty well spoke about it in that way. But there's a lot more going on here than uh, that. Uh, I, I believe that has a tremendous part to play in verse 5. I, I believe that. But I say again, there's more to it than that. And in today's generation uh, of, of believers, uh, unfortunately, the more than that is often left out. Uh, we, we think God supplies our physical, material needs, and that's it. And, and so there is an entire generation of believers that have grown up in the last years that think of God as giving them stuff. And of course you have the entire Bible. And, and let me underscore this, and I want you to know I believe this, that the entire Bible is filled with promises and illustrations of those promises that he heals our sick bodies he supplies our physical needs our material needs that's the kind of God he is and speaking of those material needs Jesus said your father knows and the very fact that your father knows for Jesus meant end of anxiety end of worry the Holy Trinity is with you in your life totally. And, and so, yes, the fact that Barzillai, that old chief of the desert, 80 years old, got on his camel with all the supplies behind him, joined with other two chieftains, and they came and they gave it to David just at the point of his need. Physical, material help. But I say it again. We, we have a greater need than that. That doesn't mean we cancel that out. We've just got to realize 
There's more to me than my body that needs food. There's more to me than my body that needs a bed to lay on. There's more to me that needs sustenance and food. And the food that I need in my innermost self cannot be supplied at a fast food restaurant or any restaurant. Now, what is described here? Having said that, let, let's look at it again. What he's saying here, a table you, you have uh, prepared for me, and, and that means it's spread before me. And then he goes on to say, you anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. We, we've got to remember this is David looking at himself as a sheep in the flock of the shepherd. And every night the shepherd would arrange that wherever they were, even if it was the valley of the shadow of death, the shepherd would make sure that he would arrive at sunset at a sheepfold. Some just like a, a great U with a, a hole in the side. And, and so you would go in. It had been built by shepherds ancient times, repaired by other shepherds. It was just a community thing to have these sheepfolds scattered through the wilderness. And every shepherd knew to be there by sunset. And there he would herd the sheep into the sheepfold. And as he did so, and we talked about this a long time ago, um, the, the shepherd took his rod. You know the rod that comforts me? Well, he took that rod and he held it low to the ground and, and called the sheep by name. Remember, each one had a pet name. And, and they would come under that rod. They, they couldn't rush in, you see. They had to go under the rod. And as they went under the rod, the shepherd would expertly feel them, examine them. Uh, for cuts and bruises, anything that had maimed them, anything that was hurting, bruising, whatever. And, and his hands as it ran over the sheep could feel that. And if the sheep was hurting, he would rub in oil and, and it would be healing oil. And the sheep would go in. And then the shepherd would have gathered uh, sheep stuff during the day. The, the tidbits, that which the sheep enjoyed, and he would uh, spread it among the sheep. It would be their evening meal. And then with a fire lit, the shepherd would lay across that entrance. He was not only the shepherd, he was the door of the sheep too. Any predator would have to get through him to get to the sheep. And so uh, uh, David, thinking sheep thoughts, was inside the sheepfold, and he can look out as he feasts upon that table the shepherd has spread before him, and he can see the eyes of all the enemies, the predatory animals, and their eyes are catching the flickering light of the fire, and he knows they're not going to come any closer because the shepherd is my protection. That's basically what's behind this. He, he is speaking... Uh, of, of this relationship with the shepherd who provides the table and is the one who calls him by name, anoints him with oil, and is his safety and protection. But he's speaking, I say, more than physical food, which was so important, but he's speaking also of the inner food, which is for his inner person. Uh, food. Well, what do we really mean by food? That's a rather daft question. But w w when we take food, th then we're taking in. It's the intake of life energy. A and in the food that we eat, there, there's the vitamins, there's the minerals, the protein, the carbs, and so on. And, and, and that life energy is going to fuel every cell of my body as it has need. And so I am strengthened, I'm sustained, I'm upheld by food. But you see, we 
need, we desperately need food, sustenance, strengthening for our spirit. That, that's our inner person, inner person. And let me say this very carefully. This actually is a very important point I'm trying to make. Without that food for my inner person, you know, you, you are body, but you're massively more than body. There's more of you that's invisible than is visible. When I meet you, there's a lot more that I can't see with my physical eyes to you than uh, one could ever imagine. Uh, you're invisible inside, but you're invisible all around you too. A and when you meet people, you, you feel that invisible. If they're filled with joy, there's an instant connection to that joy. And if you're in a state of sadness, you're liable to try and suck some of that joy. It's a tangible thing, you see. You've touched energy. If a person is bitter and angry, you can pick that up in two minutes. Though there's no signs around them, but you, you that invisible part of them, you see. A and we need, uh, need... You, you were created, batteries not included. You see, this is more than need. This is basic living 101. I need food for my inner spirit, my inner person. And, and without that food, then I am a hollow person. Hollow. You could knock on me and I echo. Only there will be a dull echo because it's the hollowness of dead on the inside. Lights on, nobody's home. <clears throat> now, when I come to eating in the scripture, that, that's a massive subject. <clears throat> Have you ever seen that? As you read through the scripture, there's a sense in which it seems they never stop eating. Um, anything happens and they sit down and they eat. Um, and then when you get to the New Testament, how many of Jesus' parables are about sitting down at a banquet, a king calling a great feast? Um, and, and then the references that we have to the relationship with, with the triune God and us, his people, often comes over in, in words that are connected with eating food. And, and the very central part of being a believer in the body of Christ is the uh, Holy um, Supper of the Eucharist, the, the great thanksgiving, um, Holy Communion. It's a meal. And, and, and so eating has a tremendous place in Scripture. And if you've never studied that, you've missed a lot of what's in the Scripture. Now, let me go one step further into that, that eating in Scripture, I would say 99% of the time, is to do with covenant. Because people in Bible days didn't just sit down to stuff their faces with somebody else. They, they sat down to do something with that other person that was a very deep bonding. When you ate food with a person, it was either to initiate a covenant and to place your hand upon the table with their hand and eat of the same loaf of bread, drink of the same cup, and declare that we are blood brothers. Or it would be sitting down to celebrate covenant. And again, they would be eating of the same food and, and thus celebrating we are one. That, that again, if you reread the Bible and read that into every meal, it makes a great deal more sense. And, and, and here you have David the sheep, and he's already spoken in covenant terms, those binding terms. The Lord is my shepherd. He's not just God in the sky. He is intimately, personally related to me. He has covenanted with me. 
That is, he has given himself to me. If you are um, joining us and you're fresh to this, let me very quickly say that in today's world, there's really no covenant, not in the West anyway, it's plenty in third world. But in the West, we don't know what covenant is. In fact, we have substituted the word contract. A contract is a document of suspicion. It means I don't trust you. So we're saying you've got to do this and do this and do this. And if you do that, then I will do this. And we both sign it. And if you don't do it, there's judgment to pay. Well, that's contract. Um, but it binds people together, but there's we, why did we make contract? Because we couldn't trust each other. We made contract to make sure we get our end of the deal. Um, co covenant is, is the Bible word, which means not I'm suspicious, but I love you to the nth degree. And therefore, I give myself to you unconditionally, even if it costs me my life. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has given himself to us. He has said to you and I, he said it from the beginning of the Bible, but all of that pointed to Jesus, who is the final covenant word of God to you and I, God from God, to tell us, I love you, I give myself to you in totality even joining you in your death and taking you out with me in resurrection. Covenant. And I say again, at the center of every covenant is a meal. God and man and woman sit down at table and they eat together. Covenant. And what do they eat but the ultimate food? The ultimate life, the strength that strengthens my spirit and then ripple effect into my mind and my emotions, even to my body. Now this, in the Bible, is what prosperity means. You see, in, the, in sicko west, we say prosperity is having stuff. Material things feed your body have plenty of money in the bank equals prosperity. Bible says such a person is poverty stricken, they are the wretched poor. No, pr prosperity in scripture is just what I've said. It begins within, that my innermost person is fed. And then it ripples out the divine life that is fed into my inner person goes out and affects even my possessions and my whole social contact and my place in the workforce and so on um, eating you see what would the scripture say and this I, I say is just a few I, I could comb the Bible for scriptures like this but these are some of those that stand out you remember in Deuteronomy 8 where the word of the Lord to ancient Israel was man which means mankind, human beings, you and I, man shall not live by bread alone. He shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He says you, you can't live uh, on food alone. You must be alive by eating, receiving, listening, obeying every word that is proceeding out of the mouth of God. And remember, Jesus is the final and ultimate word from God. And so, in that sense, we do not live by bread alone, but by that word of God, who is Jesus, who is constantly communicating in our innermost person. It's interesting, when tempted by Satan in the desert, Jesus used that text. Well, when the devil, how did the, de the first temptation of Jesus was about food. Isn't that fascinating? 
And Jesus replied to him with this text. But what about in Psalm 90, and I think it's around verse 14, where it says, satisfy us. In fact, it says, oh, satisfy us. That's the, the cry of the heart. Satisfy us with your loving kindness, that we may be glad and rejoice. Well, the, the word satisfy there is interesting that it should be used in that sentence because elsewhere it's a word that is used to describe being stuffed with food. It's the word you would use after a Thanksgiving dinner. <clears throat> You're satisfied. It's when you push yourself away from the table and you say, I couldn't eat another thing. That's the word. It means glut, even gluttony. It, it, it means satiated, stuffed. But he doesn't use it about Thanksgiving dinner. He says, satisfy us, glut us, feed us till we can eat no more with your loving kindness. And loving kindness is the covenant kind of love. The love that will not let you go. The love that speaks to you of your worth in the eyes of God the Father. Shown to you through Jesus the Son. Communicated into you by the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, fill us. Fill us until there's, we can't take any more. Fill us with your loving kindness. And the result is, he said, we will be glad and we will rejoice. And then Psalm 34. Uh, do you remember? He, he's giving his testimony uh, of the deliverance of the Lord. And again, that, oh, he said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and, and there, of course, taste, that's a, an eating word. You taste food. Well, this time he said, taste the goodness of God. And in tasting that goodness, see, which is a word which means begin to understand it. That's interesting. He doesn't say see, that is try and understand it, and then taste it when you've got the hang of it. No, he says, first of all, just gorge yourself on the goodness of God and you'll get to understand it. Uh, that, that is, accept this, receive this covenant love until you're satisfied. Taste of this goodness of God until it begins to dawn on your dull intellect that He is love and you are the object of His love. And you're satisfied at the table where loving kindness and goodness is the meal. Jesus, who lived among us totally as one of us, and, and I, I underscore that, totally, he, he took to himself our humanity so that he faced life as us through our eyes and through our ears. He, he came where we are. And, and so as one of us, Jesus said, do you remember the, the situation? That they'd been walking for a long way. They come from Jerusalem area, and, and now they were in Samaria. That they had walked. Oy. They'd walked probably all morning until early afternoon. And, and it says that they were very hungry. And, and so the disciples went off to the local village to try and find some fast food to go and, and bring it back to Jesus. And while they were gone, you remember the woman of Samaria came to the well to draw water. And Jesus, well, in a, in a sentence, he ministered to her the love of God. He gave her an acceptance that no one else in the village gave her. And, and she ran off to tell everybody. And the disciples came back just as she's leaving. And, and Jesus wasn't hungry. Now that's fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating. He wasn't hungry. He'd been very hungry an hour ago, but he's not hungry. And, and the disciples say, what's the matter? Has somebody come here and gave him something to eat? Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know nothing about. 
And then he said, My meat, my food, is to do the will of him who sent me. I find that fascinating. I mean, don't, don't try and get all mystical on me. It, it's talk, they've gone to get food. They come back with food. And, and Jesus said, you know, really, right now, I, I, I don't feel hungry. I, I have meat. And, and he's playing it against the physical food. And, and he said, I have just been satisfied with a food that is so satisfying that, quite frankly, it's taken my physical appetite away for a bit. Well, what the will of him that sent me. That, that is, he is saying that the, the love, the pleasure, the delight, which is the meaning of will. He says he, he, he lived in the fact the Father said to him, You are my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He walked in that and lived in it, and he shared it. He gave it away. You could say that digesting the love of God into our spirit, into our inner person, the digestion process is, is to give away the loving kindness and the goodness of the Father. You know, and I'm not going to go here, maybe, I'll just say it, that many times, and when I say many, I really mean that, but not every time, but many times, persons who are, I hesitate to use the word addicted, but I guess my word is pretty close to that, a person who just stuffs their body with food or pours drink down their throat or just can't stop accumulating stuff, material things, possessions, and it's just... That's all it is. It's their life is eating and drinking and gathering stuff and material things. Many, many times they are desperately trying to get that food into their empty, starving inner person. And of course it never gets there. Um, that is not food for the inner person. The food of the inner person is the love of God communicated to that inner person by the Holy Spirit. But if you don't see that, then there's such an ache within. We sometimes mistake that ache for physical hunger and physical thirst. And, and so off we go to try and stuff what cannot be stuffed. Well, enough of that. I, it's very significant, though, back to our ideas of, of, of food for the inner person. Jesus said, didn't he, in John chapter 6, that he says, I am the bread of life. Now, I mean, of all things Jesus might have said, in fact, it, there in John chapter 6, it, where he said it, the whole chapter gets him into an, a, an awful lot of trouble. And a whole bunches of people walk out on him because they just don't get it. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And the rest of the chapter speaks very blatantly uh, of eating him and, and drinking him and imbibing him into our innermost being. And, and in so doing, um, we, we have that strength of inner person. We, we have the life of the inner person. We are lifed by the love of God. And uh, the rest of the New Testament testifies to that. And if you've read the New Testament, you, you'll remember it at once. The, the number of times where it speaks of Christ in you. No, no I mean, uh, it means what it says that your inner person has been joined as in covenant. You have been joined together with God the Son in his humanity, the man we call Jesus, the Lord, the Christ, who is given to you by the Father, who is realized in you by God the Holy Spirit. Food for 
the invisible me. The table is spread within us. Christ is our life. He offers himself to us and says, eat me, drink me. And we gather together with other believers and in the symbol that conveys what it symbolizes, we take a, a, a bread and wine that has been made uncommon by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says we eat his body and drink his blood. It's the center of who we are. We are persons who live on the divine humanity of Jesus that is joined to us by the Holy Spirit. Now let me say very strongly, and I'm going to say it stronger in a minute, this is not, what I'm talking about here is not for an elite class. I wish I could see your faces. I wish I could get through this screen and talk into your eyes. This is not for an elite. Please understand me. I've just been describing the gospel. This is Christianity 101. He has spread, he has prepared a table before you, before you, you are included into the covenant of which I speak. That's what the message of the entire Bible. And because we are included, there's a chair for us at this table that is set within us. And we simply say, yes, what else is there to say? We, we, thank you. I realize that it's been prepared. It was prepared in the cross and the resurrection in the person of the Lord Jesus. It is now given to us by the Holy Spirit. You see, people say, what do I have to do to get to such a table? What do I have to do that Christ lives in me? Oh, bless your heart. You have been raised in legalism, haven't you? <clears throat> Believe means to trust, and we trust the gospel, and the gospel is the good news. He, the God who loves you, has already done this. And I say thank you. And I yield to him who is my life, and the Holy Spirit within opens it all to me. You know, we, one of the greatest things that I learned, it was back in, oi, 1960, I suppose, 1961 maybe. Never forget it, never. Changed my entire life from that day on. I, and it was in Northern Ireland. I, I, I was near Londonderry and sp on, on meetings. I was preaching. And as I paced my bedroom staying with some persons in that neighborhood uh, and as I pay don't ask me why you know one of those things it just is the Holy Spirit opens your eyes and I began to read and it was in John chapter 14 and I began to read instead of you I put my name in there and I began to read it out loud as Jesus speaking directly to Malcolm and such a surge of life rose within me. I kept on reading and reading, just putting my name in. That whole discourse of Jesus in the upper room changed my life. I, I suddenly now was hearing him speak to me through every part of Scripture. It, it, it's me, my name. Personalize the promises. Personalize the commands too. Personalize the Scripture. The table is spread before you. But he says, he anoints you with oil. Now, any feast that you would go to, you didn't have to be a sheep to be anointed with oil. Any feast that you went to, any, any I say feast, any time you're the honored guest in a house, which remember has all these covenant overtones, but it would begin by the anointing with oil. Beautiful, beautiful ar aromatic oil that would refresh you, that would uh, bring health even to smell it uh, and restore you and, and they would pour it on your head 
and they would wash your feet because you'd walked on the dusty roads in next to nothing on your feet and they would then pour the oil on your feet and that would be just the beginning of the feast that's where you began and all through the scripture the anointing with oil is a symbol that conveys what it symbolizes of the Holy Spirit so okay go back to what I said that the shepherd would gather the sheep into the sheepfold by bringing them under the rod this is mentioned in scripture and when we talked about it we referenced it but it, it, it came in under the rod called by name and at that moment that the sheep is under the rod of the shepherd called by name and the hand of the shepherd now is going over the sheep examining knowing at that moment that sheep is the most important sheep in the flock in fact it's the only one in the flock at that moment has the total attention of the shepherd do, do you realize it fits in with what I just said you are counted by name for some reason I feel I must emphasize that you are counted the father counts you as his own and he counts you by name you are known your name shall be used to describe you for ages unto eternal ages you are known he calls you by name what, what, what I've thought well, so every hair of your head is numbered. Boy, is there more to that than I'm going to talk about. But every hair of your head, he knows you. As Jesus said, as he speaks about the cares and the anxieties of life, Jesus said, your father knows. He didn't have to say any more. He he knows your cares he knows what you're facing he knows you right at this moment you are known to him by name and every cell of your body is open to him every care is known and the holy spirit slash anointed with oil the holy spirit it is you see the holy spirit is god you do understand that don't you when God says, I am, the Father says, I am, the Son says, I am, and the Spirit says, I am. And the Holy Spirit is God. He is love. And, and, and the, the Holy Spirit, who is love, ministers strength and healing, ministers encouragement, ministers restoration and empowerment wherever we need it at this present time what a feast the Holy Spirit I, I think we've got to understand something because really I, I don't know really as I said earlier on I don't know who's watching uh, uh, some of the names that come up at the end I, I know you some of you maybe others I do know and don't realize it um, and around the world similarly but what I'm trying to say I don't know where you stand in terms of the Holy Spirit but but can I say this without the Holy Spirit or shall I say marginalizing the Holy Spirit because you're not without the Holy Spirit even though you might think you are but you're not for no man can be a Christian without the Holy Spirit, says Romans 8. Uh, and it is our bringing the Holy Spirit from being marginalized to absolute center. The new covenant is the covenant of the Holy Spirit. It is the blood of Jesus, the person of Jesus by which we are in covenant but it is the Holy Spirit that at 
actualizes that covenant within us, that, that brings into our lives all the promises and blessings of that. And I, I find so many persons that marginalize the Spirit, are terrified of the Spirit, and in so doing, they have a very empty, hollow kind of Christian life because the Holy Spirit is the key, you see, to eating of this food of love and goodness that is upon the table spread before us. It's the Holy Spirit that causes David to end this little verse with that triumphant shout, My cup overflows! It's a cup of blessing that again was given to the honored guest, but he said, you've put too much in it. There's too much blessing here. Or as when I was preaching in West Africa, the, uh, in, in the pidgin English that they speak there, um, that they, they tried to say their feelings. And, and so at the end of the meetings, they, they said, uh, pa, which is the way they address us, and uh, Pa, we love you plenty too much. And, and uh, then uh, later I received a, a, a little embroidered thing on that. We love you plenty too much. And, and well, that's it. That's what David is saying. You've not only filled my cup, it's spilling over. It, it's, it's making a mess everywhere because the cup is too full. My cup of blessing spills over. It's the mood of these persons who have yielded and yes to the covenant. Jesus never spoke in gray, dull language, you know. He always spoke in sort of excessive terms, like, I am come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. And when it comes to Paul, he had to make up words to describe the superabundance of this life. And when he, Paul spoke to the Philippians, a verse that many of us know, he says, My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Supply. Supply. Well, that, that's back to the word satisfied. Earlier, just before he said this verse, he said, I've learned the secret of contentment. Uh, content is a condition of your inner person. Supply, you've been supplied. He spoke in chapter 1 uh, of the supply of the Holy Spirit that had gotten him through the imprisonment. And then in Ephesians 3, he speaks of being strengthened in his inner man, supplied. <clears throat> supplied all and that takes on everything you see as I said biblical covenant prosperity begins within and ripples out and so it covers all all your needs and that's an all-inclusive word which means the needs of my inner person but also the needs on my grocery list and he supplies those needs according to his riches in glory. That's the food of this table, the riches of his glory. And it's a, he supplies according to those riches. That is not according to the state of the economy, not according to what the world condition is. He deals with us according to his riches in glory, which are ours in Christ Jesus. Now, D David is speaking the, these extravagant words. I mean, a table prepared before me in the presence of my enemies. I'm anointed with oil. My cup runs over. But hold it just one minute. David was in the old covenant. Do you realize that? I have to keep bringing him up to date uh, into the new covenant. But David was in the old covenant. Now, very obviously, he's having the blessing that he describes here, but he's under the old covenant. Now, if you've read the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, it says, we, and he's very specific, he, 
the writer to the Hebrews calls that the old covenant. And then he says, but we are in a better covenant. That is, everything that they enjoyed in the old, we are in a better covenant through the blood of Jesus. And the better covenant is characterized by the Holy Spirit being given to us in fullness. Jesus used that same term um, in the upper room. He said to the disciples who were, of course, at that time at the very end of the old, coming into the new, which would be in the blood shedding of Jesus and the resurrection and ascension. So they're in the last hours of the old. And Jesus said, it is better for you that I go away, go to the Father, so that the Holy Spirit can come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, it will be better. And that word better that Jesus used means to your greatest advantage. When we took a trip to Israel so many years ago, and people were going gaga over the holy sites, you know, and they wanted to touch these stones that were, were to do with these sites. And someone said, if only we could have been here when Jesus was here. And I said, we've really got to get our act together, you know. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away. Can you get that into your head? It's better for you that he left. It's better for you that he ascended. And in his ascension, he gave us the Holy Spirit. And he said, the Holy Spirit is the better. And Hebrews says, yes, because it's the better covenant. It's the covenant that's actualized in us by the Holy Spirit. So Paul prayed, and his prayers were not uh, begging for the impossible. In fact, I'll quote the whole thing to you. He says, I am praying for you that you will be filled with all the fullness of God. The fullness of God. And if you think that's too much, then he goes directly on linking to that and saying he's able to do exceeding abundantly above beyond all that we can ask or think. What I've just asked for you is the best I could do. But he does more than that. And it speaks of under the new covenant joy unspeakable and full of glory and glory means the outradiance of the love of God he says you ordinary believers who go and work on duck sides and factories housewives office workers he says you filled with the fullness of God you joy unspeakable full of glory or Paul again says, this kingdom of God we talk about is righteousness, which is a word, it's a covenant word. It means to be walking in tandem with your partner in covenant. So that you are walking in the love, righteousness, peace. And God's peace is not because everything's at peace. You have a peace, whatever the state of things are. And joy in the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians, it speaks uh, of receiving love that increases and abounds, which is the same idea of spilling over the sides, splashing over everybody you meet. I say, this is the new covenant, but even David's language is very extravagant language in today's church. See, that's why I say, I don't know. I don't know where you go to church, if you go to church. But... This is very extravagant language to many churches that I, I know about. In fact, I'd, I'd go as far as almost another world to talk in this kind of extravagant language. And what I hear from so many people, I mean Christian people, is that Jesus was so different to us, you know. I've heard it. Well, he was God. To you, if what you say is is true, what you just said is true, then we're finished. It's over. 
Of course he's God. But he took to himself your, my humanity and limited himself to that humanity because he was going to overcome sin and Satan and death and bring the Holy Spirit as one of us. He joined himself to you and says, where I'm going, you go. Let's go. And he carried you in a human body. He carried you into death. And in a body blasted out of death by life, he carried you to the Father. Oh, no. Jesus, you don't. No, Jesus. He had the Holy Spirit without measure. But you see, he was the prototype of you and I. He's the prototype of the church, of believers. And when he ascended, it says, he shared with us his Holy Spirit experience. And so Jesus, with the, joined with the Holy Spirit, he now gives you a share in that. You and I are participants in the same Holy Spirit that came into the human race through Jesus. And so he said to the disciples concerning the Holy Spirit, He is with you. Yes, he's with you. Because he dwelt upon Jesus and the disciples were with Jesus, so the Holy Spirit was with them. But he said, speaking of the new covenant, our day, he said, he shall be in you. You're going to know him like I do. Come on, get with it. Paul wasn't different to you. David certainly wasn't different to you. Peter wasn't different to you. I mean, read these chaps. Read what they say. No. The Holy Spirit potential in you is, let's say, it's unlimited because you can't even think that far. Nor can I. Let me tell you a little parable. There was once upon a time a restaurant it didn't it was a strange restaurant it didn't serve food it had access to it but they never served it and uh, people would gather there in the restaurant once a week and they would read the menu out loud read it in great detail and they had a special spokesperson who would explain in detail the very meaning of the words of the menu and all that the menu offered and would illustrate what he said about the menu by referring to people who long ago used to eat what the menu talked about but of course that was just illustrations and then they would sing songs about the food that was on the menu and when all was said and done they left the table in the restaurant starved gaunt emaciated sad weak some of them had to support each other out of the restaurant and one day one of their numbers showed up with a strange smile on their face and sort of a little bit of hamburger hanging out of the side of their mouth and when they began to talk about the menu this person nodded knowingly and then wanted to share that he'd actually eaten something that was on the menu they were horrified and they excommunicated him as a fanatic from their little gathering silly parable but you see, San Antonio, I know, is filled with buildings that claim to be restaurants of the inner man. The trouble is they don't serve any food. They sing about it and, and, and they have the menu. And they talk about the menu. But if anybody would dare to suggest that the Holy Spirit actually fed them 
and their cup really does overflow to the point where they hardly know how to tell it. No, I'm afraid they'd be asked not to come back again because in such places such inner feeding has been substituted with programs and entertainment and it has become those restaurants that don't serve food have become a what shall I say a subculture club and everybody in it has a fundamental religious despair because they know that there's hardly a word of scripture that is actually working in their lives Jesus spoke to a church once like that and he said if anybody hears my voice let him open the door and I will come in and the word he used was we'll have a long evening dinner together I will sup with him <laughs> and Jesus said all of this in the presence of mine enemies that is in the worst of times in the worst of times it's interesting the, the words here you prepare a table before me okay the word before me in the presence of my enemies the word before me and the word in the presence of they're not the same word but they almost are I mean it means in your face it, it means right in my face he's prepared the table and right in my face are my enemies and what is David saying? I choose to look at the table. I choose to look at the supply. I choose to imbibe of the inner strength. It's what he did in Psalm 3. He looked at the enemies and said, Many there be that say of me, There is no hope for him in God. How many are those increased against me? You know, you remember Psalm 3. And then we're okay he looks at the enemy then he looks at the covenant table and he says but thou O Lord are a shield to me you are my glory you are the lifter of my head and he's eating so I don't know I almost sound sometimes like an evangelist tonight instead of a teacher but I'll finish as I've been talking are you content this is an honest question it's a believer to a believer. Are you content with irrelevant religion? The restaurant that doesn't serve food. Or, and, and I mean, I mean this, do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? And remember that word righteousness doesn't mean a rigid steel list of horrible rules. Righteousness means walking in the love that God has for you and responding to that love and, and living in what I've been talking about. That's righteousness. Jesus said, Oh, blessed, supremely joyous is the person who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for they should be filled. It, it, I, I think we could all do with it to pray for such a hunger. Pray for hunger pangs of my inner man. Pray for an unquenchable thirst of my inner man. Because when the hunger's there, the Holy Spirit rushes in. He always does. Our problem is we've gotten so used to a book that's a menu instead of him speaking to us by name of all that is ours in Christ Jesus pray open my eyes to see the feast before me pray that I see the promises of God are yes to me to you and give thanks you have prepared it that this is the essence of it all. 
He has prepared it. He has prepared it. Nothing you have to do to get a chair at the table. You're there. That's the meaning of the incarnation. That's the meaning of God taking to himself every one of us and saying, we're in this together and I'm getting you out of here. And you, your name was there. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is. The cup of blessing is. Then it is for us to say thank you and yield and receive that which is ours in Christ Jesus. So yeah, he supplied all of David's physical needs and did so by covenant brothers that he stirred up. But he also provided David's innermost needs. And David arose from this to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, um, there it is. Um, and I trust it has blessed you and shall continue to be a blessing to you. And um, we've come now to, um, yes, I did it right again. And so if you have something to share about this area that we're talking about or questions, then I'll attempt to share and answer them for you. Is there anybody who has something to say? Or did I do it wrong? Is there anybody out there? The last time this happened, aha, Denny, yes, Denny. I have a wonderful relationship with Father, all because of you. Um, all because of me, remember last week, Denny, it is a fact, and it's a fact that I am a, made aware of um, many times. Uh, the Holy Spirit always uses human beings. Please understand that. We, we, we've, you see, we live in this horrible and some Christians never get over it. They live and die without realizing there's no separation. No separation. No separation. I've had to say it two or three times. And um, I, I am so aware that our praying is within the Holy Trinity. We are in Christ and in Him we pray to the Father. And it's the Holy Spirit that... that makes that all real and actualizes it and and so when he answers the prayer it is through another human being and if many people have prayed for you that you've never even met don't even know um, God does nothing except through human beings and so I know what you mean Denny because of you and because I think we're both mature in this walk I do know what you mean and I know what you mean um, it was me, the Holy Spirit, used in your life to, to bring this to you. And I give thanks to God, not only for you, Denny, but for so many others. And so many others who have sent us emails or written letters that echo that. And we haven't answered you because, honestly, I just don't have the time to do it all. But um, thank you. And I, I recognize, yes, the Holy Spirit has used me these uh, nearly 60 years to share this message with the world. Okay, Melody, where in Hebrews does it mention the New Covenant? Um, all of it. If you read the book of Hebrews all the way through, he will keep saying or showing better than. And so... In Christ Jesus, he's better than the prophets, chapter 1. And then it goes on, he's better than Moses, better than Joshua. And then 
it comes to it's a better covenant and, and the central chapters of Hebrews are all about the new covenant and how the old covenant is passing away and so uh, I suggest you would get a, 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 a modern translation and just read right through the book of Hebrews and you'll you'll find it. it's all over the place that's what Hebrews is about that's its message um, and Ray McCarty, Houston, I do believe. It is working. Just saying thank you for tonight. Amen. Sugar says we're too full to talk. I'm very happy with that. Just be still and know that he is God. Brenda, you've made me very hungry tonight. May that be for every one of us. Yes, Lexi. What an eye-opener. Put my name in John Thiessen. Never occurred to me I can put my name in all the promises. Yes! That's it. That is very true, you know. I know many people that put their name in John 3.16 as a means of understanding the gospel. But that's every promise in the Bible. Change your life. Change your life. I understand this better after our son was killed. He prepared a banquet for me in the presence of my enemies. Amen. Um, so often David in his situation and that could be echoed by many many people Malcolm you fed us a delicious feast why don't most pastors and preachers know and teach this message many even teach the opposite if I knew the answer to that question I mean I, I know some of it I, I don't know if any of you know see I am uh, according to Western academics, I am totally uneducated. I don't have a high school diploma, and that was because of my church. I went to a church that shall be anonymous back in the 1950s, and they declared that Jesus was coming back that year, so we all had to drop out of school and win the world for Jesus. I dropped out of school, even though I was on a course straight into Cambridge University, and um, so, because I didn't get a high school diploma, never went to university, and Jesus didn't come back. And <clears throat> so I plunged in with the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And I thank God now, I didn't at the time, it took me 10 years to forgive that church, but now I thank God sincerely that. I did not go through the theological schools that I might have ended up in because I would then have been cut like a cookie uh, just to regard the Bible as a book that one analyzed, dissected, and who, who knows? I don't know. God knows his business. But because I was left with the Bible and the Holy Spirit um, and then open wide to the teachers that the Holy Spirit led me to, um, I, I seem sometimes to be on a totally different page to many pastors and preachers who feel that they're locked in. I, I have shared this with many pastors and one of the answers I get too many times I've heard pastor after pastor say to me I dare not go into what you're saying because if I ended up believing it I would lose my insurance my uh, retirement and, and I, I don't know what I'd do because they're locked into their denomination and must preach what the denomination says and, and I, I, I don't understand that yeah, this has cost me salary, it's cost me insurance, it's cost me retirement. Yeah, of course. Um, anyway, but my, I, have, I have a heart for pastors and preachers and reach out to them as often as I can. Um, too, too many, I, I suppose bottom line is, too many, not only preachers, but also just plain believers, they believe something because somebody told them. I never want you to believe what I tell you just because I tell you. Go to the book yourself. Call on the same Holy Spirit. Teach me. And teach me whatever it costs. And so, 
Uh, I know that's not an answer, but it's an attempt. Okay. Um, Bernie, we love you plenty too much. Yeah, yeah. For what you said tonight, plenty too much. We just discover that love loved us, as you said, and my jaw is on the floor to know what you said. I want to cry. Go ahead and David said, I wet my pillow with tears. Good for you sometimes. Also a jolly good laugh in the presence of God is good too. But Lexi, I have a place at the table with my name tag by my plate. You got it. Awesome. Amen, amen, says Denny. And again, Ray Chavez says, the spirit and the bride say, come. And when will the church hear? Amen. Helene, thank you, Malcolm, for this presentation. So fulfilling, and I pray that I get hungry more so that the Holy Spirit fills me even more. That's a good way of saying it, Helene. You see, it, we don't purchase um, the, the, this incredible life. The Holy Spirit gives us as much as our hunger capacity can handle that makes sense and so what you've said there Helene that's it pray that I get hungry more so that the Holy Spirit can fill me more so my hunger is my capacity to receive so um, Sue from Massachusetts what does it mean do not grieve the Holy Spirit basically that and of course you see that comes at the end of what Ephesians chapter 4 and you've got to take it in context and he's been speaking about putting away bitterness and unforgiveness and anger and malicious speaking and all those ugly foul things that belong to death and he keeps saying put them away and then put on the love of God put on forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you and that's where he places do not grieve the Holy Spirit and without going into much more detail which these moments do not allow but I think every one of us knows what that means by experience that if you say an unkind word, there's a check within you. And I, I, I see that check as the Holy Spirit saying, no, that, that's not the way we work. No. Um, it, it's, it's when uh, you, you might, what? Uh, hold bitterness, hold a grudge, refuse to forgive. And, and there's that sense of that precious person of the Holy Spirit who is one with us who will never leave us nor forsake us but what we are doing is shall I say hurting him it's it's not him and therefore it's not us because he is self of ourself and so we get that sense that check don't go any further there that's not who we are. I remember sharing this with some drug addicts or, well, they just come to Jesus. And I said, now the Holy Spirit's inside of you. And he has no problems with drugs. In fact, he's your strength. And so on. And um, one of them came back the following week and he gave to me. He said, his pusher, the one that had been selling him drugs, offered him this free bag of heroin. And he said, he... he and then because he tried to explain this feeling of his inner person he he said I heard him say oh no we don't he said the Holy Spirit said no that's not for us anymore and he said I suddenly felt strength and walked away well that's at least the beginning of talking about that scripture but it read it in his Ephesians 4 it, when I walk out of love, when I'm out of step with the Holy Spirit, then uh, He loves me enough to be grieved. But not grieved in the sulky sense. That's human. This is grief 
He loves you so much that he wants you in step with him. Okay. Um, Jeffrey, do we experience it by believing the reality, the fact that we are included in the covenant? My dear Jeffrey, you are in the covenant. I mean, let, let, let's get some things behind us. Some things, uh, some things come up here on, on the ranch, and my response is there are some things you don't pray about. I mean, if it's a done deal, it, it's the way things are, it's the final fact, I don't have to pray about it. It is so. I start enjoying it. And, and so you will experience this when you stop thinking of how to get into it or to wonder if you're in it and to just what can I say just forget yourself throw everything to the wind and start going nuts in rejoicing that it is so it is so um, it, it, it's a sort of spirit tension that says what do I have to do to experience this Forget about anything you have to do. Recognize Jesus has done all. Fling up your arms. Shout your head off for joy. And uh, but there, no, there's nothing to do. And in that sense, believing is just sitting back in your chair at the table of God and saying thank you. So I, I hope that uh, helps. Um, but the reason I say it, Jeffrey, is because there's a little bit of this in every question that you ask every week. And I don't mean that to demean you or to make you feel threatened. I'm trying to help you right now. That you're looking for an experience and what do you have to do to get there? But there you are already. You see, this... I mean, we've been saying some things about the church, and I hate doing that, but I, I find many churches are continually telling you, okay, put it this way, you're sitting down, and some churches spend their entire existence telling you, you've got to sit down, try and sit down. And I come along and say, okay, relax, isn't it great to be sitting down? But if you're sitting down and someone tells you to sit down, you go through agony wondering, how can I sit down when I'm already sitting down? But this mustn't, can't be sitting down because he says I'm not. You get into religious confusion. Um, but no, you're, you're there. Can, can you believe that, Jeffrey? You're sitting at this table. The oil is pouring over you by God's grace. Your cup is spilling over everywhere. Enjoy. When I lived in New York City, we had some old Itali Italian mamas in the church, and they would come at the uh, church suppers with their big meal of spaghetti, and they says, "Manja, manja, eat, eat." Well, okay, we're sitting at the table. Manja, manja. Okay. Sewing. My enemy is cancer, and it is brutal, and some is to be treated only by God. I think it is the receiving of healing that is my issue, not God's willingness to fill my cup. Can you give me a tip? The fact is, he is your health. I don't believe that there's any formula and there's no box in which we put God to arrive at healing. I believe that many times we have it in our heads that this is the way God must do it and therefore we miss what God is doing. And I'm not saying that's you, I'm just saying that. And there's no formula because love doesn't need a formula. I believe that we receive the healing day by day, hour by hour, especially 
as, as you are speaking of your condition, that because Jesus has carried in his body, according to scripture, Isaiah 53, Matthew chapter 8, it, it says that he bore our sicknesses and our pains in his own body, along with all of our sins, and he, he finished it. And, and because of that, we're not asking God for a favor to be healed, we're asking as Jesus himself, that Jesus who bore our sicknesses, we ask of the Father that which is our right as believers, healing, health in our bodies, and then we praise him. We, we praise him in the pain, we praise him as we go through it, that his healing life is now coursing through our bodies. If the way that his healing will come is in doctors, then we bless the medicine that it shall be used to heal us and all ill effects and side effects shall be cancelled. And if he is going to work a miracle, we just give him thanks. But we are thanking him for his healing life. We're thanking him for his gifts of healing that flow through our bodies. Again, back to the is. When we see it is something on the horizon and we've got to do something to get there, then we're holding it up. Rather, we give thanks that now that healing that is ours through Jesus is now in our bodies working by the power of the Holy Spirit. When it says in Philippians, it is God, that is the Holy Spirit, who works in you to will and to do of His good pleasure, I am telling you, I, I don't know your name, sewing. You, put your name in there, okay? I'm giving you that scripture in the name of Jesus. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, you'll find it in there. It says, for it is God. Take that part of it where it says, for it is God who is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And your taking of that scripture is for your healing of every cell in your mortal body. Use it in the morning, use it mid-morning, use it noon, use it in the afternoon and evening. God is working in my body, in the cells of my body, to will, the mighty will of God is working to your healing, and He is willing and doing of that which is His good pleasure. And so now we join together in this room, every one of us, and we lay our hands upon this your child and we declare that this cancer and its root in the darkness has been dealt with by the blood of Jesus by his death and his resurrection and even now we ask for a gift of healing to flow through this body banishing cancer replacing every cell with life so we declare it and give you thanks, Father, as we together say, Amen and Amen. Okay. Our pastor often says, without God we cannot, but without us he will not. God bless you for taking the time to share what the Holy Spirit has given you to build the body and kingdom of God. Christ, thank you. Russ, if God the Holy Spirit always uses people, then he's being single, missing out on the love of God, since we are vessels of him to others. Uh, I don't quite see how that fits together, Russ, um, being single, um, because our being used... Um, most of the time, let me tell you, the being used of God, you are totally unaware. 
You know, when I hear what Denny said further up and all the others said further down, and the, the letters, I'll be very honest, very honest. As I read some of those emails of Wad and um, we've had a, three or four letters recently that have spoken that people have, uh, through these webinars, have, have jumped up and wept and danced for joy. I'll tell you exactly what I say before I start giving thanks to God for it. My first reaction is, you've got to be kidding. They must have been listening to somebody else. And that's the honest truth. It amazes me. After 60 years, it amazes me that the Holy Spirit used me. But one of the most common things that go through my head when I when I hear, you've got to be kidding. I. I read or uh, heard, I forget which, a testimony just within the last two weeks. And they mentioned a phrase that I said that changed their life. And I, it's one of those things, don't ask me how, the, the message was given back in the 1980s. They heard it on a CD. But I remember, it's one of those crazy things you remember. I remember saying that phrase and it was an add-on. I just threw it out there as a sort of one final way of saying what I was trying to say. It was not part of my notes, it was just I threw it out there. Don't ask me how I remember that in 2011, but I, I did. And that phrase changed a person's life. I said, you've got to be kidding. Um, our love, which is the energy of the Holy Spirit to transform people's lives, is many times done when you don't even know about it until afterward and maybe that afterward will be in the presence of Jesus um, we we don't go around looking for people to bless at least I, I never do um, if I come right to that person I bless them that that is my basic greeting to bless people with faith uh, and that includes when I go to the local Sonic and pick up a, a drink for anyone at the ranch and when the girls or gals come on their roller skates to the car with the drink uh, I, I will say that God bless you and if they share a problem I say we'll pray about that sometimes when we've been there Nancy's gotten out of the car and prayed for the car hop but um, normally, you don't, you don't go out sort of, I'm the official blesser, I've, I've come to love you. You just be you. And that includes your spouse, which would it be, uh, you're married. But if you're single, you've got your entire world. And if you've got a spouse, you've got your entire world. And, and so, um, we are, and it doesn't matter um, whether we're married or single, if that is what you're talking about. Um, but no, um, Paul wa was single. Um, there's very good reason to believe his wife um, left him or divorced him because he became a Christian. Now, that's another story. But definitely as Paul, the Paul we know in his letters was single. And he's the one who tells us more than any other of the love of God flowing through him to others. And so I hope that helps and I hope I understood the question. Um, so now there's a thing on my screen here that makes this very difficult to read. Um, I'll get there in a minute. I'm not too computer savvy here. Ah. Isn't the Bible God's means of grace through which we feast upon him, sure hope? Um, yes. Uh, let, how can I put this? The Holy Spirit is the means by which we feast upon God. And Ephesians 3 says we are strengthened in our inner man
by the Holy Spirit. That's the clearest statement and we could go on through that. I say that because there is a grave danger in today's evangelical church to make the Bible, that is the book, um, into what it's, it's not. Do you realize that essentially what you and I mean by the Bible <clears throat> uh, was not known in the church for around 1400 years. The Bible as we know it came into being around 400, 500, but that was in laborious copies by hand and the average person didn't have such a copy. And then it was in the uh, Latin language, which was the language of the scholars of Europe for centuries. And it wasn't until 1400 and the advent of printing that we began to have something that resembled our Bible. So we've got to be very careful because I see I, I could agree with you totally. I mean, I've told you I've memorized the New Testament and most of the Old. So I, I believe in the Bible. And the Bible, yes, the Bible is the means by which the Holy Spirit speaks. But if you don't put Holy Spirit first, you'll end up with those places that treat the Bible as the menu without food. I mean, there's gazillion churches. We live right next door to one. And, and all they do is read the Bible and talk about the Bible. Uh, but they get no means of grace, you see. So it's the Holy Spirit will speak to us through the Bible. And the Bible is not the first means of grace. If we go back in church history, the um, Holy Communion is the means of grace. The, the, well, let me go back for, first. Baptism is the means of grace by which the Holy Spirit uh, actualizes in you this reality that I was crucified with Christ and nevertheless I live. Holy Communion, the Eucharist, is the Holy Spirit's means of grace by which you feast upon the humanity the divine humanity of the ascended Jesus. And then uh, you, you have the Bible and you have prayer and we could keep piling it on after that. The means of God will use anything and I am to you the means of grace right now. And your brothers and sisters in Christ and some of the people that write on this screen are the means of grace for the moment. But always number one, number one, number one is the Holy Spirit. So a person can read their Bible every day and get nothing out of it. It's the Holy Spirit who makes it alive. And I would rather have one verse of Scripture made alive by the Holy Spirit than say I read through my Bible this year. So I hope that helps. Again, um, I have to say that because usually there's so many questions um, that come out of questions. Um, okay. When should I be... I, I don't understand. When should I be cautious of my enemies? Especially when God prepares a table. I'm very aware of my enemies. I'm very aware of the powers of darkness. But you never pray with your enemies in your face. You pray with the table of God's provision in your face. You're aware of your enemies, but you, in a sense, being very aware of them, turn your back on them and give glory to him who has overcome all the powers of darkness and, and has given you open access to the Father and all the grace, whichever means he chooses, uh, to come. Um, it's a big point. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and in the first verse it says of Jehoshaphat, 
that uh, he gets news of his enemies coming to destroy him and it says he was afraid okay he sees his enemies in the presence of my enemies and the next phrase says and he set his face to seek the Lord that is okay I'm aware of my enemies I'm, I'm not denying them I'm, I know them but I set my face to seek the Lord which is another expression for what we're talking about and so I, I am always with my face toward the Lord my prayers are not terror panic prayers because I've got my eyes mesmerized from the eyes of my enemies I turn aware of my enemies and I stand in the fear of the Lord which is being standing in awe uh, of, of my father so I hope that helps um, how can I know all the promises of God from the Old Testament are for me too yes uh, the New Testament quotes promises from the Old Testament and makes them ours um, when Paul said 2 Corinthians 1 about verse 24 uh, all the promises of God that is as many as they may be are yes in Christ Jesus and amen by us to the glory of God what promises was he talking about remember he's in the middle of about AD 50 55 maybe yeah no I'd say maybe more AD 50 so in AD 50 what promises of God were there the only thing Paul had was the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. He was writing it. So all the promises of God that he speaks of were Old Testament promises. But just to give you an illustration, in Hebrews 13 and verse 5, it's the famous verse, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, therefore, what should I fear? What can man do to me? that they are two quotations from the Old Testament it's from Deuteronomy 31 and I don't know about verse 27 I think but it's uh, um, Deuteronomy 30 yeah anyway it's when Moses brings Joshua lays hands on him and, and the Lord says to Joshua to Joshua to Joshua I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll go ahead of you, go behind you. Repeated to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 verse 5. Writer of the Hebrews picks up the whole jolly lot and says it's for you. With no apologies. And then Psalm 27 says, Whom shall I fear? What can man do to me? And he quotes that right along with it. So he jumbles promises together and says they're all for you. So yeah, I take the entire Bible as the Holy Spirit speaking to me and he picks promises out and applies them to me wherever I I happen to be Russell dropped out of seminary years ago only to be placed in the seminary of the Holy Spirit amen and amen incidentally I'm not against seminaries and if you are a seminarian listen to everything I say and incorporate it into where you're at Go to class, listen to your professors asking the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of your understanding. And if they're speaking lies, give you the wisdom to hear it as lies and to know the truth. But no, I'm not against education. I Maybe that's why he kept me out of seminary. I'd still be there. The smell of books. Talk about addicts. I'm addicted to the smell of books. I can spend hours in a bookstore, especially a secondhand bookstore. Oh yeah, I love education. Holy Spirit drags me back, drags me back, blessed dragging. He's the teacher. That's number one. Number two, you don't know anything until you put it into practice. That was the basis of my seminary of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, yes. <laughs> Crying is. Bishop, this is why I attend he's talking about the Bible school we have here and um, thanks for getting me in trouble and keeping me there yeah um, Ray came to our Bible school graduated and he's now um, ministering in Colorado and um, the Bible school we have here is based on what I just said uh, it begins by 
looking to the Holy Spirit, expects the revelation of the Spirit and ends by go do it. There's no exams, no tests, because the Holy Spirit will give you plenty of tests and exams out there in life. Um, Jim, when Jesus says to eat his flesh, is this accomplished by communion? And thereby hangs a couple or three hours of teaching which I do on the Holy Spirit and liturgy or the Holy Spirit and sacraments. Holy Spirit and sacraments is a, uh, I think just four tapes, I'm not sure, but I deal with it there. And um, bottom line answer, that would take me at least two hours to answer, but bottom line answer, yes. I believe that and um, when we partake of Holy Communion, we believe it is a Holy Spirit event in which I, I say the symbol that conveys what it symbolizes we eat of his body and drink of his blood I believe that and in the CDs um, Holy Spirit and Sacraments we deal with that um, yeah once I was given a prophetic word that started out with tell my name I made them repeat the phrase over and over and he said my name um, amen um, I, I believe see names in the Bible are of such importance the name of God can does change your life if you know his name and that's what praise his name call upon his name changes uh, one of the most important things I can know in life. And your name, because you are included into the covenant. Um, so he who celebrates his name has joined your name to his name. And we all give praise together. Um, and I'm going to finish with this one. We've gone over time. When I was a child, I cried out to Jesus, help me, and he blanketed me with his love. But when I went to church, um, I'll find you in a minute. Yeah. When I went to church, I couldn't understand what they were talking about, but I've always held on to him. What happened to you as a child is the truth. The help, see, the word Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit is um, paraclete in Greek and in John 14 15 16 it's translated as comforter better word would be helper and so when you cried out to Jesus help me the Holy Spirit hugged you which is the meaning where it says in the Bible the Holy Spirit fell upon them in plain up-to-date English it means gives you a bear hug so when you were a child, he bear hugged you with his love. And um, young, maybe whatever church you went to, you couldn't understand. I, I would strongly suggest that you get hold of a number of my um, CDs or MP3s or hang out with us on this uh, Tuesday night and um, you're going to understand a lot more about this. But understand that you were hugged by the Holy Spirit, which can be many times experienced as being blanketed with his love. Um, and to give you the name of many of the teachers that have helped me would take a long time and some explanation because not all of them I fully agreed with. Uh, and so maybe I'll do that another day. I've got to finish now. And so now I bless you with the blessing that streams to us through Jesus in the Holy Spirit. That blessing now be upon you in your innermost person, in your mind, in your emotions and in every cell of your body and in all that you touch. The blessing that comes to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and stays with you this night, this week and unto the ages of ages. 
Amen. I'll see you next week. <laughs>